get started. Okay, where Errol left you last time was at the very beginning of, we're about to start probability theory. We've talked about when you have a sample and you have some data, you have some numbers that you've collected. We've talked about taking those numbers and uh, doing descriptive things on them, which might be their central tendency, the mean, the median, the mode. Might be something about how spread out they are the variance, the mean deviation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but all that was based on data already collected. Um, but the general idea will be that when we collect data and want to describe them, we want to describe them relative to an idea of uh, a theoretical model of whence the data came, uh, which leads you to this side, which is the theory abstract side that the data came from some abstract object that we'd like to describe mathematically, be able to manipulate, uh, be able to make predictions from any given abstract model, and also, later on, uh, next week, starting next week, uh, have an idea of a general abstract model, but be able to learn about it by finite quantities of data. So, uh, this is, so the idea is that if you have this abstract model and believe in it, the data you collect, the measurements you get, are effectively uh, samples taken from this abstract model, uh, but that um, the, our, our job as a scientist is to come up with alternative models over here, collect data, and then make inferences about which model is correct, that's called model comparison, or for any given model, what are the parameters uh, judging its um, behavior. So the estimation. So just to make this, you know, slightly more real, um, you know, imagine, uh, you know, two different approaches. One is uh, you have a statistical model over here um, that in some particular town there's this. Just, everybody's got two kids, but the distribution of genders is known to be in these proportions across you know, all, everybody that is in that town at that time. So that's our model for the town. Uh, and imagine that we know this. And so uh, you might ask, um, you know, if you pick a family at uh, uh, random, and you look at that family, and you ask about the gender of one of the kids, uh, and then estimate what's the chances of any particular gender of the other kid. So that would be, we've got the model, and we're going to, ask about implications you can make from that model. Okay, so that's dealing with the abstraction. Uh, on the other hand, uh, oops, sorry, there's a, there's a sequence here that I'm not remembering. Yeah, so this is a probabilistic model. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we may not know the underlying probabilistic model. We may only know data. So we have data so far, which is we've um, surveyed the population of this town, and we haven't asked every single family in the town. We did a random sample. Uh, you'll be hearing lots of polls over the coming year. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll be way too glued to them. Um, so you have this survey data. So these are data. This is not a probabilistic model. It has, um, you know, 32% have two girls, 23% have uh, two boys, and the rest, 45% um, have one of each. Um, but those numbers are not true of Middleville. Those numbers are true of our sample of Middleville. And so you might want to say, how do we go from data to estimates of the underlying model, knowledge about what the underlying model parameters might be, um, ranges of parameters that might be uh, likely to happen, what might not. So this is, you know, in the level of sort of statistical inference, you start from data, you try to infer something about the underlying probabilistic model and then be able to make uh, conclusions based on that underlying estimated probabilistic model. So that's kind of where we're headed. And the way we're going to head there is to uh, introduce uh, probability theory. And probability theory we're going to introduce in two bits. This is all kind of reordered from the way we've done it previously. Um, to try to um, do a lot of the bits about uh, probability distributions of one variable develop all the terminology uh, for one variable, and then a little bit later, which we'll probably <coughs> get to today, uh, what happens if you have uh, more than one uh, measurement? What if you have, happens if you have multiple variables? Okay, so this is just an outline. We're going to start talking about what's a probability distribution, what are calculations you can compute on probability distributions, 
what happens if you take that variable and you um, uh, transform it in some way, linearly or nonlinearly, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, some of this will be very familiar because some of this got introduced in lab last Friday. Um, so if there's anybody here who wasn't here on Friday, this will be at least potentially new for you, but for those of you who are on Friday, there will be a little bit of redundancy. Okay, so probability distribu distributions come in two flavors. One is when the uh, potential outcomes are discrete. Um, so for example, this is a discrete random variable corresponding to take two dice, roll them, and compute the sum. Uh, and that's something you did on Friday. So the sum could be 1 and 1, 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 2. Uh, those could be their individual dice. The sum is the sum of those two numbers. Uh, so 1 and 1 gives you 2. 1 and 2 or 2 and 1 gives you 3. 1 and 3, 2 and 2, 3 and 1 gives you 4. So each time we're going to the right, we're getting more and more options, more and more possibilities that would have generated that sum. And so we have this distribution that's discrete. Now discrete here is discrete and finite, but you still use the word discrete when discrete is not finite. So for example, um, a Geiger counter listened to for five minutes could produce zero counts, one counts, two counts, 5,000 counts, 40 million counts. Uh, it could produce any number. The probability of it producing you know, 10 to the 48th is pretty much zero, but it's possible. And so um, for something like that, uh, it's discrete but potentially infinite. Uh, and so when it talks about distributions that are uh, over a discrete um, uh, values. Now, uh, basics are um, that probabilities are, you know, you know, in English, you can talk about what's the probability that you get a 12 as your outcome. Um, probabilities are numbers that are between 0 and 1. 1 means it's certain. Zero means it will never happen, and somewhere in between tells you the likelihood of it happening. Um, if you have all the possibilities accounted for with probabilities, well, when you roll two dice, you're going to get a sum. The probability of getting a sum is one. It is certain, which is to say that all these probabilities have to add up to one. So that's all this says down here, is that for every possible outcome, the probability is a number between zero and one. This says less. It should be less than or equal to. It could be that <laughs> I'm going to roll a die and I'm going to ask about an event, um, an outcome, and maybe this die has ones painted on all sides. In which case, the probability of a one, <coughs> one, it's certain. Okay. So probabilities can be zero. They can be one. Probability, for example, of getting a sum of one, summing two dice. Well, that's a potential outcome, but it's a potential outcome that will never happen. So you could. Have included that in the set and said its probability is zero. So these could be less than or equal to. Um, but if one of them is equal to one, that means it's certain, and any other possible outcome obviously has probability zero, and you know that because they have to add up to one. So if you're already at one, nothing else is possible. Okay? We will also talk about continuous random variables. Our standard example, the one that we're going to go back to over and over again, is the normal distribution or the Gaussian bell curve, uh, but there are many other possible distributions of continuous random variables. Um, for them, you end up with this uh, function that I'm graphing here called little p of x. I've used capital P over here. I will not be consistent about my notation, but this difference between capital P and little p is worth pointing out. Capital P is the probability of each event, so probability getting a 12 it's 6 plus 6, so it's one possible outcome out of the 36 possible rolls of, of two dice. And so its probability is 1 out of 36, otherwise known as 0.03 something, which is why the bar is that high. Okay? So that's something that can actually happen. You can actually get a 12 when you roll two dice, box cars, as they're called. Um, on the other hand, the probability for a continuous variable of any given outcome the probability that you, you know, this looks like it's the distribution of IQ scores, um, and the probability that the IQ score you get for a randomly chosen person being 105.628374, the probability of getting that exact number is zero, basically, because there's an infinitude of possible outcomes. And so when you talk about continuous distributions, the y-axis is not 
probability. The y-axis label for P of x is not in units of probability. It's in units of probability density. Probability per unit on the x-axis. So they still have to add up to 1, but now it's continuous. So add up means take an integral. So the integral under this curve has to be 1 for it to be a probability density function, which is what little p is called. So when you integrate under a curve, remember from you know, high school calculus, what you're computing is the area under this curve. And the area under this curve is 1, which means the probability of this thing shooting out some number, I don't care what, is 1. It will give you a number if you consult it. Okay? Um, but in order to talk about events that have probabilities that are non-zero, they have to have an area. So if I pick one single value, say 100, and look at the area over 100, well, it's 0.026 high, but it's zero wide. It's a rectangle with no area. In order for it to have an area, you have to pick a range down on the x-axis and get a shape that is up here, up to the blue. So shapes like that have an area, and so events that include a range of x values will have non-zero probability. Any given one won't. Which means, since you're computing area, probability is uh, area above here, which means that the height is uh, per x-axis. Multiplied by x-axis gives you probability. So the height is probability per unit of the x-axis, you multiply by that by the x-axis width, and now you get units of probability. So areas have units of probability. Okay? Everybody with me? So the y-axis here is different than the one on a histogram. A histogram, the y-axis is actually probability, because this bar just represents 12, not 12.1, not 11.9. You can't get those. When you roll two dice, you might get 12, you might get 11. You won't get anything in between. So above 12, the height is the probability that you're getting exactly 12. Over here, any given height is the relative likelihood. You know, if you go to another value and it's twice as high, that value is twice as likely. But that specific value is never going to happen again. You can run this till doomsday. You'll never get that exact value if you get something close by. But exact values have probability zero. But ranges above them are an area and they have a non-zero probability. Okay, so that's our basic terms. A couple other basic terms. I've got these little x's uh, here, and these are little values. So um, I won't always be consistent with this notation, but when you look in books that do mathematical theory of probability, often they use uh, a um, convention uh, that if I write a little x, say, that's going to be a possible value of my variable. When I write a capital X, that's usually referring to what's called a random variable. A random variable is an abstract entity uh, which every time you consult it will spit out a new value. So when I draw this graph, I can have a random variable called X, capital X, which is I'm going to roll two dice, and what am I going to get? And it's an abstract entity that will take on different values with different probabilities. So I'll occasionally talk about random variables. We can do mathematics on them. We can ask what are their probability distributions or densities, depending on whether they're discrete or continuous. Um, but um, sometimes I'll be switching between small and capital letters, because that's the convention in the field. All right, so let's talk about some possible uh, probability distributions you might meet. So, um, coin flips. Coin flips are things that have two possible outcomes, and since they only have two possible outcomes, they are totally described by saying what's the probability of one of the outcomes, because the probability of the other one is always going to be one minus the probability of the first one. I did not erase the word before, so that wasn't good. Um, So if I have a fair coin, the probability of a head versus a tail would be 0.5 and 0.5, but my coin might be unfair. So this would be coin number one, and I may have coin number two, 
where somebody has stuck a little bit of weight on one side than the other because he wants to win at some coin tossing game. And if the probability here is 0.4, the probability there is going to be 0.6. Why? Because probabilities of all the events have to add up to 1. So this is always going to be p. This is going to be 1 minus p, no matter what you have. Okay? So that's called a Bernoulli random variable, or a Bernoulli distribution, if you just state the two numbers. So a random variable that obeys Bernoulli is a random variable that's discrete and has two outcomes. That's all you need to know. There's no other kind of discrete two outcomes. If it has two outcomes, one of them has a probability, and the other one has the rest of the probability. Okay, you can take that, uh, and you know, uh, similarly we were just talking about rolling a, a die, and a die is a cube with you know, numbers on the faces from one through six, and if it's a fair die, it means that when you roll it, all the possible outcomes are equally likely, so you get this flat distribution, one six, one six, one six, one six, et cetera. Uh, this one we had up before, which is, if I roll this die, I'm getting the numbers from 1 to 6. If I roll this other die, I'm getting numbers from 1 to 6. And if I imagine that the roll of the second die is completely unaffected by the roll of the first die, I didn't put them both in my hands and roll them together, I rolled one and I shook my hand again and rolled the other. So now there's 36 possible outcomes, the roll of the first one and the roll of the second one. And if I assume that those 36 outcomes are all equally likely, then this is 1 out of 36, because 1, 1 is the only way to get it. This is 2 out of 36, because 1, 2, and 2, 1 both add up to 3. This is 3 out of 36, etc. You just count the number of possibilities and you take them out of the hole. So this is a kind of a standard way to reason about discrete probability distributions of the kind where all outcomes are equally likely. Because for such, um, for such situations, So if you have a, a situation in which it's discrete, and there are various outcomes, the outcomes, uh, you know, are, you know, x1, x2, I'm just naming the outcomes. Uh, those are my outcomes. And if I s have some reason to believe, or my theoretical model is that these are equally likely, that any given event, any given outcome, for example, the probability that I get either x1 or x5 or x18. So this is an event. I'll put set notation around it. Is just how many outcomes are in it versus how many outcomes are possible. So this is 3 out of 36. Okay? So we can often reason that way. And you know, when you're reasoning about rolling dice or drawing a card from a deck of cards or situations where it's discrete and finite, we'll often use this logic of just counting to uh, compute what the possibilities are. OK. Um, so these are all finite. Um, we'll also um, meet at some point. Oh, no, I guess I should do it right now. Um, yeah. Um, they're not all up here. I forget whether they're coming. I don't think they're not, so I'm going to do them now. Um, so this is the coin flip. This is the Bernoulli. But we are often concerned with multiple coin flips. Think psychophysical experiment in which I ask an observer to do a task with two possible outcomes, you're correct or you're not, governed by some probability p of being correct. I don't know what that is. And then I have the observer do the same task a hundred times. And if I have the underlying assumption that each time I ask them to do the task, they're again trying to do the task and their probability correct is p, I don't know what p is. But if I knew what p is, I could ask what happens, how many times are they likely to be correct on 100 trials if on any given trial it's probability p. And so again, you have this counting argument of what are the possible outcomes um, out of all the possible outcomes. So, if I'm going to, let's, let's do it for a small number. So, it's like coin flips. So, let's use the coin flip example. So, suppose I have an unfair coin. Uh, let's pick this unfair coin. And I'm going to say, what's the probability of getting three uh, heads out of 
five uh, tosses. Okay, so we got to count. Um, so I'm getting three heads, and all those heads had probability p. I'm getting five tosses, all those had probability 1 minus p. But I can't just say that's what happened, because I tossed them in an order. I had a first toss, a second toss, a third toss, a fourth toss, etc. So I have to deal with the fact that they're, oh, there's one over here. Um, the fact that they can come in various orders. So. Uh, let's talk about that, because that's a counting thing that I'll be stuck with doing. So, big table. I'm not going to fill up the whole table because 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 lines on the table. I don't want to do that. But I could have gotten head, 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 head. I could have gotten tail, head, 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 head. I could have gotten head, tail. There are lots of possibilities there. There's two in the first spot, two in the second spot, two in the third spot, two in the fourth spot, two in the fifth spot. And uh, so I have this issue of I have this event that I'm interested in. And there are lots of ways to get three out of five. I could have had, and I'll start, start listing some of those, I could have had head, 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 tail, tail. I could have had head, head, tail, head tail, I could have had head, head, tail, tail, head, etc. A bunch of them. Which means that we need to count how many these are and what are their respective probabilities and all these other ones and their respective probabilities. So I'm just leading you towards where does the binomial distribution come from. It deals with under the hood all of this is happening. These guys happen with probability p. These guys happen with probability 1 minus p. Getting five heads is p times p times p times p times p, because I'm assuming that I'm doing them separately. The math for that will get back to a few slides hence. Uh, getting five tails is 1 minus p times 1 minus p times 1 minus p. Getting four of each. So each of these events has a probability based on, oh, I got four heads and I got one, uh, you know, one tail, or whatever it is. Plus, there are all these possible outcomes. We'll come back to the binomial a little bit later, but all I'm saying is that in developing a discrete distribution, you basically need to look under the hood, see what the possibilities are, figure out the probability of each, take the set that are in your event out of the hole to get a probability. Okay? Um, I'll write an equation for that at a later time, but a little early on that one. Uh, similarly, there's a whole cornucopia of continuous distributions. One is obviously the bell curve, which we're going to talk about quite a lot in the coming weeks. Uh, they're kind of inescapable, and we'll tell you why. Um, another one uh, is related to the Poisson. So the Poisson distribution, let me give you a formula. Let me not write it down the wrong way. Um, so I'll make sure I don't write it down the wrong way. Um, So the Poisson distribution, and Geiger counter is the obvious example, but spikes coming out of a neuron are often modeled this way, is the idea is you have this device, it's spitting out events at an approximate rate. So let's say, and there are various ways you'll see this written, um, and I'm being a little more explicit than possibly one of the later slides is. So suppose the rate is I expect lambda uh, counts per second on average. Okay? So there's a Geiger counter or it's a neuron, so it counts your spikes or whatever the device is, it's spitting out thingies. I have an expected rate which is governs the process and that's, that's the parameter that I you know, might want to estimate or maybe I have an abstract model that tells me what that number is. Okay? Now, the idea of a Poisson process is every little piece of time you look at, count might happen and it's equally likely every different piece of time also has this possibility of, of an event happening. Independently, all those might happen. And so that if I wait for a duration, 
of t seconds, then the total number of counts I expect to get on average is lambda times t. That's now in counts. Okay? So that's the setup. And then it turns out that if every piece of time is independent of every other piece of time, and every little piece of time, no matter how small, is governed by this rate of events times the width of that period of time, then the probability of getting, uh, let me use the same notation, of getting k counts in t seconds is, um, so lambda t is how many I expect to get to the k e to the minus lambda t over k factorial. Um, k factorial, in case anybody doesn't remember what a factorial is, is 1 times 2 times 3 times dot 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 times k. Okay, funny looking formula but a very, very standard model. And what it looks like, it's a discrete distribution. It'll peak around the expected count, so this is the one for uh, three counts, as I recall. Um, note, lambda is a continuous number, it's counts per second, t is a continuous number, so the expected number of counts, lambda t, won't necessarily be an integer. I might expect on average to get three and a half counts. I will never get three and a half counts. I will get three, I will get four. I will never get three and a half. But the expected value, the, which is what this is, otherwise known as the mean of the distribution, as we'll discuss in just a moment, um, can be a continuous number. It can be 4.578 or whatever. Um, but the distribution is discrete because you only get discrete values. It also is discrete and infinite, because no matter what the expected count is, even if it's low as three, there is a non-zero probability of getting 10 million counts. It is tiny, but it is non-zero. This will just keep going down, 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 asymptoting to zero, but never actually getting there. Okay? So this is a, our first example of a discrete distribution that's over an infinite set, not just finite, like the rolls of the dot. Now, there's this whole menagerie of different distributions, and they're all sort of, many of them are connected to one another in intimate ways. So here's a continuous distribution, which is basically e to the minus uh, x, or e to the minus t over tau, or whatever. In this case, e to the minus t over tau, uh, pretty much, um, called the exponential. These two are completely tied. This is how many events if you wait, say, five seconds, or how many events if you wait 10 seconds. And this is, if I start now and wait until the first count comes, how long do I have to wait? And uh, you get an exponential distribution from exactly the same process that covered this guy, which is every piece of time has a small likelihood of an event. And so if I'll have, if I, the probability of having to wait a long time involves all those little pieces of time until then, nothing happened. Over and over again, nothing happened. So you have to take the probability of nothing happening and multiply by itself a whole bunch of times. And then finally something happened. So it turns out the math behind that is e to the minus t over tau. So the exponential, which is related to this, so the exponential has a parameter called tau, which is how quickly does it drop. And p of any given time of waiting is uh, 1 over the, is it tau or 1 over tau? That's uh, tall. Is uh, oh, this is written the other way. No, it's one over tall e to the minus t over tall tall. Ah. Okay, so it's an exponential. It's just something that drops. Um, it has a parameter, which is how fast is it dropping, and that parameter um, is the same lambda. Uh, well, so. The, uh, <laughs> which you can also parameterize as lambda e to the minus lambda t. So lambda is 1 over tau, and lambda is the same lambda. Okay, so lambda is a rate, and tau is how long you expect to wait. So at a high rate, 
you don't expect to wait long. So your expected wait time is tau. Your rate is lambda. Tau is 1 over lambda. So just two different ways of speaking about the exponential. One is, if I have this rate, I get this exponential, e to the minus lambda t. But another way to talk about it is how long do I have to wait until it drops by a factor of e? That's tau. Okay, uh, continuing on, as I said, there's a menagerie of lots and lots and lots of distributions, and if we had, we're doing a full semester on probability theory, we would meet all these guys. Uh, some of these we've talked about, uniform distribution, all these values are equally likely, and you can talk about a uniform discrete distribution, like this one is, with little bars. You can also talk about a uniform uh, continuous distribution, which is not uh, written, written up here, but a uniform continuous distribution would have a density function that would look like that. Okay? It can't go on forever because it has to integrate to 1, so it has to have a finite range if it's going to be continuous. And the area has to be 1, so if the width from here to here is A, the height is going to be 1 over A. Okay, so that's the continuous version of this thing, which is basically the roll a die distribution. Uh, where if there are n events, the probability of each is 1 over n, so that it adds up to 1. Um, the binomial is, is um, when you have a Bernoulli, which is a uniform distribution with two events, and the binomial is, okay, consult it a bunch of times and count how many times it came out one way. Okay? Throw the coin a bunch of times, see how many heads you got. Um, in any case, there are lots, lots more here. We're not going to go over them all. We're not going to meet them all this semester. There are a few that we will, uh, will meet um, when we talk about frequentist statistics. We'll talk about this one, and we'll talk about this one. Um, I don't think we're going to hit any of the others, most likely. We'll do Poisson. Uh, well, obviously, we all, I've already talked about Poisson, so we'll definitely talk about Poisson. Okay. So now we have the concept of a distribution. It's a theoretical thing. When we had samples, we talked about properties of those samples. We talked about what's the central tendency, mean, median, mode. We talked about how spread out is it, uh, variance, mean deviation, and uh, p-norms uh, for the uh, width. Um, and you uh, get the same exact concepts for these theoretical distributions. What is the central tensity, tendency of this theoretical distribution? Uh, how spread out is it, as, et cetera? So the, what's the central tendency that corresponds to the mean is called expected value and standard notation, although there are multiple notations across different disciplines in science. Standard, one of the standard notations is just capital E for expected value. And so you're saying, on average, what do I expect to get? So back when we had a sample, and if we had a sample, not a, problem, not a theoretical distribution, but we had a sample of some discrete uh, um, variable. Um, so we ask a bunch of families in New York City uh, how many children are in the family. Uh, maybe zero, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, dot, 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 up to some big number like 14, um, in Williamsburg or Borough Park. Um, and you get these proportions that you got in your sample. So you had, you know, uh, 50,000 families had zero, and uh, you know, 110,000 families had um, one, etc. So you get this histogram that we collected, and these are sample data. Okay. And so, when you want to calculate a mean. What would you do? Well, you'd add 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus dot 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 0 for all my 50,000 families plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 dot 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 for all my 110,000 families plus 2 plus 2 blah, blah, blah. Keep going. And I would divide that by n, the number of families I talk to. Okay? That's just compute the average. You know what an average is. But you'll notice that we can simplify this. Is it 0 times 50,000? plus 1 times 110,000 plus 2 times times however many families in that bar. In other words, uh, what we could do is sum each value x times the 
uh, proportion of families that have value x. Okay, so the proportion I wrote here, not the number, meaning I took the n and put it back in here. I put this over n, and I put this over n. Okay, so that's just a way of calculating a mean from a histogram. We've done this before, this is not new. But the point is, now that we've gone to probability theory, where the y-axis for an abstract uh, probability distribution is indeed proportion, but not sampling proportion, but theoretical proportion, it's the same formula. And hence, it's the same formula. Okay? So calculating the mean for a probability distribution, calculating the mean for a sample are the same exact concept. It's just that P of X is now this theoretical thing as opposed to over here where it's just, oh, I got 50,000 out of the you know, 2 million people I surveyed. Okay? So here it was a sample proportion. Now it's a theoretical proportion, which is our probability distribution. Okay? Um, so that's how you calculate the uh, mean of a uh, discrete distribution. Um, now, the more generally concept is sometimes we're going to take these numbers and we're going to want to transform them and calculate the expected value of something that we could do with these numbers. Not the expected value of the numbers, but the expected value of some function applied to these numbers. And this is going to come back a whole bunch in the next bunch of slides because it allows us to generalize how do we calculate various aspects of a probability distribution. So if I'm going to take these numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 down here and do something to them, double them, take one over them, square them. I'm going to do some number of something with these and say, what's the expected value of this function of the numbers? Nevertheless, I'm going to take this function of the numbers for every possible outcome, weight it by how often that outcome is going to occur, and, 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 and add it up. So this idea of taking a weighted average of something, weighted by its corresponding probability, is expected value. When you get to a continuous distribution, it's the same idea. The notation looks different because it's continuous. So I can't write sum over discrete things. I have to sum them over a continuous thing. Summing over a continuous thing is what you learned in, in first semester calculus or high school calculus. So here's the value times its relative probability of occurring, but now P of X is not a probability, it's a probability density. It's the kind of thing that you have to integrate over the x-axis in order to get. And so expected value is going to be, of x is going to be integral of x p of x. Expected value of some function of x, for example, x squared, is put the function of x and weight all possible values by the density. Uh, take x, subtract a number from it, and square that number. That's just a function of x times its relative probability. So you can put all kinds of functions in the expectation and calculate what's the average value I would have gotten if I did this over and over and over again and did a sample average. So the idea is, this is a theoretical entity. It's giving you a theoretical number. But what do you mean, think that number means? One thing it means is, if I did this experiment, if I took the random variable x, and consulted it, I got a number, an actual sample. And I took it and subtracted a number and squared it. Now I have a new number. So now if I consulted x again, got another sample, subtracted mu squared it, got another number. Did this over and over again, then took a batch of numbers I got and added them up, divided by n, took an average, then that would tend to come out like this. This is in the you know, limit of infinite amounts of data. What should I get? So that's what, another way of thinking about an expectation. Why we call them expectations? What we expect to get on average if we do this over and over and over again. So now let's look at what we have up here. The one up top is the same as the histogram formula. So it says if I have a continuous distribution of whatever shape I got, in my distribution, this is P of X, this is X. And so I want to say, What's the expected value of x? Meaning, where's the middle of this distribution? Where's the mean? Well, if I actually cut this thing out of, out of you know, some substance and put it on a 
teeter-totter and said, where do I balance it? As we said with the histogram, this is the same thing. If you took a physics class, you would have seen this calculation because that's calculating the centroid of an object. Right? Where does it balance? Um, so it's the same thing. It's a measure of central tendency. And it's using the histogram formula. Um, now, before we get on to the other ones, let's point out that this is like a dot product. What's a dot product? Here's a bunch of numbers. Here's another bunch of numbers. Let's multiply them point for point and add them up. Here's a bunch of numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 14. Here's a bunch of numbers, 50,000 out of n, 110,000 out of n, so many thousand out of n. So it's, these are two vectors. I am dotting them and adding them, you know, multiplying all the corresponding numbers and adding them up. That's a dot product. This formula here ain't in discrete worlds, it's in continuous world. But it's the obvious analogy to a dot product between two functions. One, you know, because it's continuous, it's not a vector. It's a continuous curve. But I have one curve, which is x, and another curve, which is p of x. And point for point, I'm multiplying them, and then I'm adding them up. We're adding them up continuous means take an integral. Because it's like a dot product, it acts like a dot product. It follows all the rules of a dot product, which means that if I take the expectation of f of x, and then I take the expectation of a times f of x, where I just took the function and doubled everything, then I'm going to get double the result. If I take it for f of x and g of x, and I get an answer for what f of x gives you as an average and g of x gives you an average, and if I add those two functions, I'm going to get what each one would have given you added up. It's a linear system. It's obeying linearity. And so it has these nice rules which allow you to pull out constants and um, pull sums apart. It also allows you to add constants, something linearity does, but we don't usually talk about it. So, you know, I could put in here plus c, and the plus c would come out. Because it's just an integral, and integrals obey linearity. Integral of f plus g is integral of f plus integral of g. So integral of f times x plus g times x is integral of f times x plus integral of g times x. It's just something you learn in calculus. But it means that we can skip all that and go right down to the expectations and simplify things before we try to calculate. OK. Sometimes you, it's useful to know about how a distribution <laughs> What, what happens with expectations if instead of multiplying by x, you multiply x to various powers? And that has a name. Those are called moments. x to the 1 is called the, the first moment, but also is the mean. And for uh, uh, samples, we usually don't write mu for the average of a sample. We usually write, uh, so if it's sample, the usual notation you'll see in books. Um, you know, so if x is the thing, the, uh, the mean uh, that you get is usually written x bar, but if you have a distribution, so this is the theory thing, where again you have x, usually you write mu. Uh, similarly for uh, uh, dispersion, um, we often write sigma or sigma squared for this guy. Um, in statistics, we usually don't write sigma here. We've been doing it all semester long. We usually write something else here, and how that's computed we're going to come back to a little bit later, uh, next week, in fact. Um, but the thing that we usually put here, I'm going to put it in brackets because I haven't really defined it yet, is not sigma, you usually write s or s squared. And we'll get there in a, in a, in a while, but not this week, uh, referred to as a sample standard deviation or a sample variance. Uh, and the uh, formula is slightly different than you expect it to be, and we'll see it in a couple of slides uh, today, I think. Um, but we'll get back to it. In any case, so you can take p of x and ask what's the expectation of x, meaning integrate x times p of x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, and those are awf awfully useful for describing the behavior of a distribution. x tells you, so the, the first moment tells you where's the middle of it, the second moment has something to do with how dispersed is it, and we'll get to that in the next line. Uh, the third moment will tell you something about hey, how asymmetric it is, uh, the fourth moment will tell you something about how peaky it is versus how broad it is. So these are all things that the moments tell you. We won't be covering a lot of that in this term, but 
just all of them are just expectations. Now, this is saying how far away are most samples from the sample mean, meaning if I pick a random thing from this distribution, how far away from the mean is it likely to be in the squared sense? So that sounds very much like what we've been talking about when we've said variance, right? The variance of a sample is calculate the average distance away from the mean, squared. So this is the continuous distribution. We don't have a sample, we just have a curve. Version of that, and that's called the variance. Now, the next bit is the interesting bit, which is how a part of why moments are useful items. So now let's use some of our knowledge of the way expectations work. <coughs> And this is going to be a proof with calculus, but it's going to look just like a proof you've seen already. It was about samples. Because all the math for samples and for continuous distributions, there's analogies between them. So I want to know uh, the variance, which I'm defining as this. Okay? Otherwise known as the expectation of x minus mu squared. And normally here, I would actually put capital X to say that's the random variable. And I won't be consistent about that, but in math text, they will often, when you have an expectation, it's an expectation of a random thing. Okay, so you use capital X saying, here's this random thing. It takes on lots of different values. What's it going to be on average? All right, so let's just do some math. This is just a polynomial, so let's write it out. X squared minus, squared minus 2 mu X plus mu squared p of x dx equals, now let's do them all separately, integral, because in, you know integral the sum is the sum of the integrals, right? So that's just, that's just pure calculus. So we've got x squared p of x dx minus 2 mu x p of x, and the 2 mu is a constant, I can pull it out, minus 2 mu integral of x p of x dx plus, I got mu squared, mu squared integral p of x dx, right? So I just took this integral, which is x squared p of x minus 2 mu x p of x plus mu squared p of x. I separated them out. And for each integral, if there were any constants, I pulled them out because you can pull constants out of an integral. Everybody with me so far? Okay. What is this thing in the box? Wait. The mean? Did, what's, what's integral of p of x? No, I have no idea what it's going on. Just sums. Yeah. And what's the sum of underneath p of x? By definition, because it's a probability distribution. Uh huh. Okay, this is one. What's this? It's on the board. Yeah, that's, that's the mean. The definition, that's called the mean, that's mu. Okay, so this has now become integral of x squared p of x dx, otherwise known as the second moment. And now we have a minus 2 mu squared, 2 mu squared, and we have a plus mu squared. Which means I can just replace all this part with minus mu squared, which is what's written right here. You've seen this happen before. It was a sum, and it was about samples. Okay? That math, in statistics, that math gets repeated everywhere. It just, it, you get this funny simplification and cancellation every time you get a formula like this. So don't be surprised. It's the same math, just in a new context. All right. And again, in general, if you want the expected value of some nonlinear transformation, this is just something which has various outcomes, each of which has various probabilities. And the probabilities come from x, because x is the random thing. And so this can be written this way. Okay? So this is a general notion of expectation. But notice that the general notion of expectation, where you're allowed to have an f of x in here, where f of x could be like x minus mu squared, means that this same expectation is used to get you the mean and to get you the variance and to get you other quantities about uh, describing uh, the properties of a distribution. So you can go, you know, third power stuff, and that'll tell you something about 
Is it more stretched out on the right than the left, um, otherwise known as skew? Uh, you can have a fourth power version of it, and there's a standardized version of that, which says, is it a narrow, peaky thing with big tails, or is it a broad thing that comes to zero pretty quickly? That's called kurtosis, and so on. But all those are just a formula with an f of x in here, a particular one that's telling you something about your distribution that you would like to know. All right, so in particular, let's talk about some f of x's we could have done. So here's a simple f of x. We've got a random variable x, and we're going to change the units on the axis. So we're going to do a linear transformation, y equals ax plus b. Okay? Uh, it's not a linear transformation, it's an affine transformation. Why? Because we did a plus b, right? Linear transformations have to be lines that go through zero, but I'm adding b, so it's not necessarily going through zero. So it's not linear in the sense of linear system, but it is linear in the high school sense that it's a straight line, okay? So different sense of, of, of linear, but the fancy word is, is affine. Okay, so this is a new variable. I can ask what its, what its mean is, or what its, i.e., what its expected value is. And its expected value of this thing and expected value is linear, which is to say expected value of ax plus b is expected value of ax plus expected value of b. b is not even random. <laughs> right? Well, probability distribution you run it by, you get a run it by probability distribution of x, doesn't matter. It's, it's a constant. So you get the constant. From expected value of a times x, the a pulls out because expectation is linear, and expectation of x, and we've already defined, that's the b. So in other words, when you transform uh, a random variable by multiplying by constant and adding a constant, what you do to the mean is you multiply by the constant and add a constant. What about the variance? What happens to the variance? Okay, so it's the expectation of this formula uh, because the mean of y, uh, so I'm doing, I'm, okay, I'm going to have to do the interior steps. I realize that that skips too many steps, so let's do them all because it uses our expectation stuff. Okay, so we're asking, we've transformed this variable. Uh, I won't copy stuff that's over there, but I want to know what's the variance of this new random variable capital Y. So that's the definition is that that's the expectation of uh, Y minus mu Y quantity squared. That's just the definition of a variance. Okay? Um, now, mu Y we've already derived. It's sitting on the board there. Um, so we've now say we're doing the expectation of, so let's then write the definition of Y, which is A X plus b, and mu y, we've got over there, which is a mu x plus b squared. Okay, let's just substituting in. Okay, here's b minus b. Poof! Expectation of, I got a x minus a mu x. a times x minus mu, oh sorry, mu x squared. Okay, so the b's are gone, and I've pulled the a out, but remember we've got to square everything, so I've pulled the a out, we've got to square everything. Okay, that's an a squared times x minus mu x squared, expectation of that. Expectation is linear, the a squared pulls out. Expectation of x minus mu x squared, otherwise known as a squared sigma squared x. So, think about it this way. I got some distribution. This is p of x. And this is various values it can take on. If I multiply it by 2 and add 5. So I take whatever x I got and I double it and add 5 to it. So, you know, let's imagine that this is 0 just for the heck of it. So now I'm going to multiply it by 2, which means 
this value is going to end up over here, this value is going to end up over here. So I'm going to spread this thing out. And I'm going to add 5 to it, so the most likely value now is 5. I'm going to get a new distribution over here, which is P of Y. I'm going to take the values that used to be really probable, I've now doubled them all, so I've spread them across the axis wider. Okay? So the width of this guy is sigma x, and the width of this guy is sigma y. I've just told you that by double, doubling it, I've increased the variance by a factor of 4, which means that sigma y is a sigma x, taking the square root. So if you double it, you double the standard deviation. The a squared is about variance, which is a quadratic, right? So that's why the a squared is there. So if you double all the numbers, you make it twice as wide. That's all. The height has to come down. Why? Say that louder. This is more spread out. Yeah, no, no, no. That, there's a specific reason why it has to come down, why the height of the distribution has to come down. Because the distribution has to satisfy what? It has to integrate to 1. So if you're going to make it twice as wide, you're going to have to make it half as high. Okay, so the actual formula for the density is going to have a 1 over A in it. Okay? Okay, so that's a simple transformation. And here's the 1 over A. So let's look at what happened here. I'm asking, what is the actual curve? Now I'm getting a formula for the actual curve, the one I drew, which I said had to be half as high. So the value at y is going to be related to what the value was before you transformed it. So if I want to take any particular y, say this particular y here, I'm going to say, oh, there's an x that led to that y. So it was, you know, I've been working with uh, y equals 2x plus 5, which means that x equals y minus 5 over 2. Okay? So I'm going to go back, I'm going to subtract 5, I'm going to divide by 2, and I'm going to get the corresponding x equals y minus 5 over 2. And I'm going to get the height there. So the height here has got to relate to the height there. Right? The highest point will be the highest point on this new graph. You know, as I come down the curve, I'm going to come down this curve. Okay, so those are obviously related. So I'm going to ask, what was the probability of the other guy? But then I've got to fix it so it integrates to 1. And so if I make it a wider, then I have to get, make it 1 over a high so that I get the same area. Right? Take some shape, no matter what it is. If you make it twice as wide, then you're going to make it half as high to preserve the area. That's all this is. Okay? Yeah? Sorry, what does the px represent? It's the probability. So we have two curves here. This curve is, uh, oh, actually, I already have it here, px and py. Okay. Those are functions. And I, so when you just write p, it's a density. You have to say, which random variable am I a density of if you're going to have more than one of them running around while you're having your conversation. So we just index them to say which one we mean. Uh, thanks. I should have done that in the initial notation over here. OK. So this idea that if you take a little piece of the x-axis and stretch it out, if you shift it, probabilities don't change. Any constant doesn't do anything to the relative probabilities of things. But if I stretch it, then it probably has to go down by the same amount. If I squeeze it, probably has to go up to preserve area. So over here, over here, over here, we did that for the entire curve uniformly. What happens if the function is not just affine? But it's, a, it's any arbitrary uh, transformation. Um, OK. So if we do an arbitrary transformation, not just an affine one, but any arbitrary thing, just one that's mono monotonic. So first of all, math word, monotonic. And in particular, this case, monotonically increasing. Means that g just goes up. It never comes back down. g is a function which, as x gets bigger, g of x gets bigger. I have reviewed two different papers in the last month where someone writes monotonous instead of monotonic. <laughs> monotonous means boring. Monotonic means increasing. 
don't do that mistake, because you're just going to make your reviewer laugh at you. you don't want that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so monotonic just means that the derivative is always positive. Okay. By the way, there's obviously a general generalization of what I'm about to tell you for G that's mono monotonic, monotonically decreasing, but whatever. It's a, it's a trivial switch. Okay, here's an awfully scary looking formula for how you get the new distribution from the old one. So first of all, let's look at what's at upstairs. So I'm trying to get the density for g of x, for y, which is this funny transformation of x that could be some fancy function like log or exponential or some function that's always increasing uh, but is not a straight line and is not a straight line plus a constant but it's any arbitrarily function as long as it's always increasing. So, first of all, so let me make a, a drawing like this, but for a uh, non-monotonic, a non-affine uh, thing. Okay? So suppose, um, let's pick a particular, uh, a particular um, G. Uh, so suppose G of X equals, um, I don't know, x, e to the x. Okay? So here's g. Okay? This x, g of x. Right? And we have some density, uh, which is y. Okay? So we have some density also, maybe it's a bell curve. So here is, uh, this curve here is Px. Okay? So it's the probability of the random variable before we transformed it. Okay? So now, uh, and let's imagine that uh, the middle of this is zero again, just for the heck of it. Okay? So what is uh, g of zero? It's e to the zero is one, so I'm going to put one over here somewhere. And uh, you know, so zero maps to one, and one maps to e, <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, minus one maps to one over e. So this is just what g does. Okay, g takes you somewhere on this axis, moves you somewhere else. So if I want to know what's p of y for any arbitrary value of y. So let's pick an arbitrary value of y. Here's a, value, here, here's a particular y. So how do you get y? From x. So uh, you take its log, because so that's the inverse of exponential. And so you take log of y, and that'll be somewhere else on this axis. In approximately here, because 1 maps to 0, and e maps to 1, so this maps somewhere between 0 and 1. Okay, so somewhere is, so this one maps to that by g, g of log y equals y. Okay, so I, I, just like I did last time, I refer back to saying, okay, what's the probability of y? Well, let's go back and find out what x led to me and see how probable it is. Okay, so that's probably part of the, what we need to do. But when we did the straight line thing, we also needed to do a stretch. So if I stretch the x-axis, I had to push down. And if I squeeze the x-axis, I had to pull up. But now we have this problem that g is stretching the x-axis differently in different parts of g. If it was a straight line, and I'll use another color for that, if g was a straight line, which is the thing we did before, an affine transformation, so if this is the graph of g prime, no, g prime, let's do it, h of x, that's a straight line. And the slope of this line is how much I'm stretching. So if, you know, if I'm doubling, it's steep. If I'm halving, it's shallow. So the slope of that is how much am I stretching the x-axis, which means how much I need to squeeze is 1 over the slope. That's what I was doing before, but there the slope was the same everywhere. So what we need to squeeze by is the slope of g at the value that led to where I am now. So what's downstairs in this formula is at this location along the full continuum, 
But at the location we're at, so here's y, here's where I came from, this is the x that led to y. I'm going to go up here and say, what's the slope here? And if it's steep, that means I'm really stretching out the x-axis locally, and so I'm going to have to squeeze down the probability by a comparable amount. So this 1 over g prime is exactly what we did here. This is the 1 over a, because the slope is a everywhere. Here, we have to divide by the slope for the value we're consulting. And it'll be stretched differently in different parts of the axis. So in particular, g is stretching the hell out of things over here on the right. It's really spreading them out. And so because it's spreading them out, um, you know, because the slope is steep, um, the probabilities of any individual value are becoming smaller and smaller. And so we're going to be divided by a big number because the slope's high. Over here, the slope's really shallow. So I'm taking lots of possible x's and squeezing them into a really small area. And so that means I'm going to need to give them higher probability density. So in order to show that, here's a picture of it. Uh, oh, look at that. I didn't even remember that the f of x here, what I'm calling g of x, was in fact something that looks like an exponential. How convenient. Um, so the idea is, if you're in the shallow part, I'm taking a big part of the x-axis, which has a lot of probability, and I'm squeezing it into a very small, OK, this, just to show you how this graph is working. Uh, this is p of x, this is my bell curve. I must have had this in the back of my mind, because I didn't realize I just recreated exactly what the next slide was. OK, this is p of y turned sideways. Low values of y, high values of y. Okay, the actual p of y needs to be over here, and it look like that's p of y. It'll look like this. It's being graphed here sideways to show you how it's being constructed. Here's a very large part of the x-axis which has pretty good probability being squeezed down in a tiny part of the axis corresponding to y's. And so this big probability has to get the same area over here, which means you've got to stretch the density function to be bigger. So when the slope of this function is low, you divide it by that small number, and you blow up density. Way over here, this is a comparable piece of the curve. Its area is about the same. But now I'm taking it and stretching it into a huge piece of the axis, which means I have to push down density to get the areas to be the same. Okay. So that's an intuition. I mean, one can do a math thing to derive it. But this intuition is it's doing exactly what you want. Whenever you squeeze it down in the axis, then you have to stretch it in the probability density by exactly the same amount in order to preserve area. And so you do that in the calculus way, which is you do it in little differential amounts at different parts of the axis. So that's what goes back. Uh, whoops. Got to build. Uh, that's what this formula is doing. Now this is something, you know, it's not just some obscure mathematical effect. I find myself using this in, you know, math for modeling for something. This is actually a very useful formula. It's worth knowing. Okay, it's time, past time for a break. Let's take five. Elena. <laughs> So question, so no, if nobody heard that. Uh, Elena asked about hazard rates. You heard about hazard rates? That's talking about the exponential distribution. So have you ever heard the term hazard rate? Um, it's the same math. Uh, it comes up in, like, for example, if you want to design a task where a monkey is going to get a signal at some period of time uh, and is supposed to respond to it, you're wondering about how they're behaving. But if you never give them a, um, a trial that lasts more than three seconds, then at two average seconds and three quarters, they know it's coming soon. But if you use an exponential distribution, then they will always have the same probability that it's coming soon at every point in time. So that's called a constant hazard rate. So a Bayesian exponential, that's constant hazard rate. Uh, the other question that I had, yo, Eros, you're interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Do you have a question that I should explain so other people can hear the answer? Oh, um, I was just asking the So we have not talked about multivariate yet. That's coming soon. We may start it today. And so covariance hasn't come up because everything I'm talking about today is univariate. There's only one number when you consult this random variable. Covariance, you need two numbers, and you're asking how they relate to each other. So we'll get there, but we're not there yet. Um, I was also asked to just to walk through this one more time. Um, because, you know, this is a pretty figure, but it's you know, kind of sparsely labeled. So first, let's make sure we understand what the labels on the axes would be if they were on the slide. I should have fixed it. Um, this is little x, different little x's that could occur. So this is some random variable that has different variables. And this is p of x. I would normally put little p of x here. It's a probability density function. So this is x. Now we're going to take x and we're going to compute some function on it and ask what's the probability density of var values that that function could take on. Here's the function. When I was doing it on the board over there, it was little g of x, but here it's little f of x. And it is, looks like e to the x, actually, so it matches the example I was doing on the board over there. So we're going to take every value here, put it through this function, and get a new result. And the new result will be y which is f of x, okay? So this axis here is y, and this curve, written flipped over sideways, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not merely rotated, it's rotated and flipped, okay? So this is a graph of p of y, where this is a low value of y and a high value of y, okay? So it's, it's graphed in a funny way. If you wanted to see it in the normal way, you would move it over here and turn it upside down, okay? And that's why I drew what it would look like for you right here. Okay, this is the normal way of plotting p of y from that curve. It goes up and then it comes back down. It goes up and comes back down. So why do you get this curve out of this curve? And the reason is you're getting really high value, high probabilities for really low values of y. Because low values of y, this axis is y, this axis is x, for this curve this is x, this is y. Low values of y combine huge stretches of the x-axis, which is to say low values of y, the range from within these two little green things, the probability of getting a y value between here and here is all of this area right here. So all this area has to equal all of this area. It's much narrower, so it has to be much taller. And in fact, it needs to be even taller than it's displayed. Right? Just think about this. I've, I've divided this by like 10, which means I'm going to have to multiply the average height in there by a factor of 10. This needs to be 10 times that. So if I really drew it, it would be like this. Okay? Because I'm preserving probabilities. The probability of getting an x between here and here is exactly the same as the probability of getting a y between here and here. Because this y is where this x maps, and this slightly higher y is where that x maps. On the right, this x maps to here, and this y maps to here, which is to say it's about the same range of values, and so it needs about the same range of heights. And again, this is not the same height range as that. It really needs to be stretched by a bunch. So, Arrow, while you're marking fixes for this slide, the y-axis here and the y-axis here should probably be the same, which they aren't on this one. Map. So it'd be easier yeah, to understand. The other way where you flip the other way. Well, if you flip the other way, you kind of can't over. get away with that. But, yeah. but yes, if you flip this, it'd be easier to understand. It's easier. Okay, moving on. So we now have the notion of a distribution for discrete variables and a density for continuous variables. Sometimes we also convert that, and it's extremely useful to do so, to what's called a cumulative distribution which is a function that has a value at any given place of the sum of the values to the left of me from the distribution of the density. So because it's the sum of the values, if you go infinitely far to the left, the sum of the values to the left of there will be zero. And if you go infinitely far to the right, the sum of the values to the left of me is everything, and so it'll be one. So it's always a function that goes from zero to one. Right? The possibility of getting zero or less from the roll of two dice is zero. It never happens. 
or one or less. It's zero. You start at zero and then you climb because you're accumulating. That's why it's called cumulative. You're accumulating the probability as you go from left to right. And eventually you've accumulated all of it, which means the probability to the left of you is one. So it's always a graph that starts at zero and monotonically, say monotonic, it only goes up. It monotonically increases until it reaches one. And for a discrete distribution, it takes these discrete steps to get there because there are only discrete values that can happen. And for a density function, you're adding up to the left of me, which means at any given value down here, you're saying, what's the area from where I am leftward? So let's just do this. The value here is the area here. The value, the value here, this value, is the area here. It's the area to the left of me. And so because the whole area is 1, this curve is going to approach 1. And because the further to the left of you, the, le the less stuff that is to the left of you, as you go to the left, eventually you get to 0. Okay? Maybe infinitely to the left, for a bell curve it will be. But it's a function that is always positive and is always between 0 and 1. Remember, densities, the height is just a density. The height could be 50. It's not a probability. It's a density. 50 times this width is an area that gives you a probability. So the height on a density function doesn't have to be between 0 and 1. It be anything. But this guy, on the other hand, the height of this is a probability. It's a number between 0 and 1. And it will start at 0 and it will rise to 1. So that's called a cumulative. You can describe any given distribution under the sun using this, or use, uh, using this or using this. Using this or using this. They're equivalent descriptions. To get from this to this, you calculate an integral. Which means to get from this to this, you calculate a a derivative. Yeah, that's all. So it's just a one for one thing. Um, we were just using that a second ago because the slope <laughs> was mattering <laughs> in a transformation. And the slope here is telling you something about local density. So slope is, is relevant here in the same way as it was in that transformation case. Sometimes we're interested in, if we consult this random variable, give me a range where I'm likely to get an answer. Give me a, a range in which most values occur. So we'll talk about this in statistics for, for uh, you know, results of inferences, but those ranges are called confidence intervals. So I could say, what's a range such that almost all the area is in that range, where almost all is an arbitrary amount? So for example, if I go uh, from when the probability is 10% to when the probability is 90%, this range, that means 10% of the area of the original density is out here, 10% is over here, 80% is in between these red things. So that would be an 80% confidence interval. Now there's a bunch of stuff that's happening under the hood here that I should point out. First of all, I just found a place right here on the axis, which is right here on the axis, such that the area to the left of me is 0.1, 10%. Okay? So that place on the x-axis is a place for which values that value or less is 10%. So that is given a name. It's called a quantile. It's the 10th quantile. This one is such that 90% is to the left of me. This is called the 90th quantile. So when you use the word quantile, the number next to it is usually a percentage. What's the 50th quantile called? The median. The median is that place such that half the things are to the left of me and half the things are to the right of me. So the median is a quantile. It's the 50th quantile. We have words for particular kinds of quantiles that you may occasionally run into in the cover of the New York Times on a graph. So if you divide it into quarters, they're called quartiles. So the 25% point, uh, let's get to point 0.1, point 0.2, is that really? Yeah, so point 0.25, so this is the first quartile. The median is the second quartile. The 75% is the third quartile. You will rarely hear, but you might, divide it into 10 bits. Then they're called deciles. So this is the first decile, and this is the ninth decile. So you'll sometimes hear those words. But the main deal is a quantile of a distribution is a place where the area to the left of me is, has a, sixth, a fixed value. 
And the obvious way to find a quantile is to use the cumulative distribution because it gives them to you directly. If I want the 15th quantile, I go up to 0.15, go over and go down. So quantiles, math-wise, are just the inverse of the CDF. They specify a number on the y-axis, go to the CDF and find out what x gives you that value. That's quantiles. Okay? And so if you want a confidence interval from any arbitrary distribution, even an asymmetric one, typically you want to take this cumulative distribution function and say, say you want a, an 80%. You find where it's 10 and where it's 90, that leaves 10% on either side. So on the y-axis, it's symmetric. On the x-axis, brought over here, it may be asymmetric around the mean. It may be any arbitrary thing. This is a nice symmetric distribution to the right of the mean and to the left of the mean look exactly the same. So any confidence interval, an 80% 80, 80 confidence interval, a 90, a 95, a 99, they're all going to be symmetric around the mean. But for other densities that are asymmetric, the confidence intervals will likely be asymmetric. And I'm raising this just because when you present your data in any scientific paper, you're taking your data and you're often producing, this is statistics for next week, week after, producing something called the confidence interval, which is based on everything I know about how noisy my data are and where the middle of my data are, here's where I think the answer probably lies as best I can guess, given the model I have of where my data came from and given the dispersion of my data and the central tensity, tendency of my data. You know, so I get, um, oh, I erased it, but I get a sample mean from my data. I'd like to know the mean of this process if I'd run a vastly longer, infinite numbers of trials experiment, and I'd like to know where that is, and I'd like to know how much I trust that number that I've estimated. So to do that, you're often calculating a confidence interval. And the right way to do it is to have some model of the cumulative distribution function, pick two quantiles, and then go map. Okay? So we'll return to confidence intervals again, but I want to, uh, you know, tell you how to get it from this distribution. Another thing that's useful to do is once you have a distribution, you'd like to generate some fake data. For example, to test your estimation algorithm for estimating what the distribution is. So if you were going to go from data in your experiment to an estimate of some parameters of some model, you'd like to know how does that estimation method uh, behave, and so I'd like to make fake data sets for which I know what they were drawn from, then make estimates and see how good the estimates are. So it's often useful to generate simulated data sets that come from a known distribution, which means you'd like to draw samples from a known distribution. How do you do that? So, suppose I had a discrete distribution. Here it is. It's a bar graph, bars have heights, and the bars' heights all add up to one. Okay? And I would like to draw samples, meaning I would like to draw some number of blue, some number of yellow, some number of orange. I can draw 100 numbers, and I'd like them to be drawn in such a way that if I drew an infinite number of numbers, they would act like this. And so it turns out that that's very easy to do. What you do is you take the bars, and you pile them up. Does this sound like something that was on a previous slide? Take the bars and pile them up? What am I doing with the bars as I go higher and higher? I'm accumulating. So this is effectively acting like a cumulative distribution. Here's the probability of getting blue or less. Here's the probability of getting green or less, where less includes blue. Here's the probability of getting yellow or less, where yellow or less means yellow, green, or blue. I'm producing a cumulative and, and placing it here. Now, suppose I now choose a random number between 0 and 1, and then say, what color am I? That's a way of sampling. Another way of doing that is, let's take that lovely rainbow thing, put it on its other side, and let it start raining. Okay, so we're going to pick random numbers between 0 and 1, MATLAB called RAND. Okay. Rand produces pseudo-random numbers between 0 and 1. Every time you get a random number, you go down on this axis and say, what color am I? Okay, that's my sample. And the oranges will happen frequently because lots of rain falls between here and there. And the reds will happen infrequently because not so much rain falls between there and there. And in fact, the proportions are exactly what you want because you arranged it that way. 
right? It's a uniform random variable between here and here. And by using what is effectively, this color map is basically the cumulative distribution, you're saying if I, you know, the, the probability of uh, getting green is how much of the cumulative distribution should be called green, okay? So th for this discrete distribution, this is kind of obvious that this has to work. You, what you've done is you've taken the probability, number between zero and one, and you've stacked it over here and attributed a range that has that probability to that outcome, right? So here's a way of uh, sampling from a non-uniform, finite, discrete distribution. Suppose you want to sample from a non-uniform, discrete, infinite distribution. It'll be the same thing. It's just you'll have lots more bars, and the bars will be getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier, but they'll still be there. You don't have to say what they are. You just, for, for any given value that the rain produces, you have to figure out which box you're in. So for example, if you had a, a discrete exponential distribution, where the, where the bars are getting narrower and narrower by the same uh, factor every time. They're, you know, for example, one over two, so half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth, thirty-second, that's a distribution that goes to infinity. And so you pick a random number and then you figure out which box you're in, which is a finite, cal easy calculation, okay? So that's a way of sampling from a discrete distribution. What if we want to draw samples from a continuous distribution? So we basically want to do the same thing. But it's continuous, so we have to say what we mean by the same thing. So suppose uh, we want a sample from bell curve. Okay? So I want you know, the value of 100 to be a reasonably likely, and values near 100 to be, you know, happen fairly frequently, and numbers like 150 to be infrequent, and numbers like 400 to be extremely infrequent. So, Suppose I calculate the cumulative normal distribution, which looks like a psychometric function for those who do behavioral data, right? Number that goes from zero to one and rises smoothly. Now, what's the probability that I get a number um, here that maps to, through the cumulus between zero and 0 0.1? What's the probability that if I randomly draw from a Gaussian that I get a number such that when I go through this curve, map through this curve and come to this axis, I get a number between 0 and 0 0.1. What's the probability of that happening? Well, let's figure it out. But between 0 and 0 0.1, I'm a value on this axis between 0 and here, which means I'm a value here where the area here is 0.1. That's how I define the cumulus. What's the value probability that I get a value on the cumulative between 0.5 and 0.6? Well, let's come over here, come down, and that's going to be a range over here whose area is 0.1. The way I defined the cumulative distribution is equal things here are equal areas over here, which means that if I pick a random number between 0 and 1 over here and come back through the cumulative back down here, that I'm going to generate samples that obey this distribution. So there are lots of ways to do sampling from known distributions, but the by far simplest one is if your distribution has a known computable cumulative, then you can use the rain example that we just used for discrete, you can use it for continuous also, which is to say you drop rain between 0 and 1, and then you come over cumulative and come down, which means you use the inverse cumulative to generate your samples. Okay? So this is one, the, our first example of why cumulative distribution is incredibly useful. So if you want to generate a data set that has a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 15, which if I recall correctly is how IQ scores are scaled, um, then a way to do that would be to generate random numbers between 0 and 1 by calling RAND, and then apply the inverse cumulative normal to them. Now, of course, in MATLAB, you won't do that because you already can call RAND n, which will do it for you, and we'll use a fancier algorithm that's way more efficient. But if you had some arbitrary distribution whose cumulative you knew, you could still do this thing. 
So how many raindrops does one need to get a good enough approximation of any given distribution? <laughs> OK, there's a lot hidden in that question. First of all, let me say that sometimes what you're trying to do is not get a good representative sample. You're just trying to get a sample like you would get if you did the experiment. So if your experiment only had 100 trials, you're going to sample 100 numbers, run your algorithm for doing estimation, see what you get, then sample a new 100 numbers, do that again, and repeat that to find out how good are your parameter estimates on average. So you won't want to get a huge sample and have it generate you a pretty curve. Now, suppose you know something about the cumulative, and you'd like to say, how big a sample do I need such that I get a, a, a histogram that looks pretty close? Well, that's something you can bootstrap, meaning simulate many, many times, and find out what is like, likely to be good enough. But you have to think about what you mean by good enough. If you want to see this tail, tails happen very rarely. And you know what their percentages are because they're in the cumulative distribution. You can calculate them. And so if you want to have a few samples out here, enough so that you get the shape of the tail, then you don't just nearly need to get one here. You want to get hundreds. And if a hundreds only happen, a tenth of a percent of the time. So then you have to multiply the number you want down here times a thousand in order to get a pretty histogram including the tails. So it, it depends on your needs. But our usual needs for drawing samples is to draw samples of sizes commensurate with an experiment that we have the patients to run and find out whether that experiment's feasible and whether it'll demonstrate the thing we want to demonstrate. So the numbers of samples you're going to draw are the kind of numbers of samples in a you know, animal or human experiment that you actually plan on running. Okay. Next section, and we'll just begin today and continue on next time, is to start talking about what if a single sample is not one number, but is more than one number. So everything we've been talking about so far, the random variable, capital X, capital Y, when you, cult, when you consult it, spits out a single number. But what if the thing that you're consulting spits out more than one number? So we're now in not univariate, but multivariate probability theory. Example, randomly picked individual measure height and weight. So now the individuals are people, but the measurement is a vector with two numbers in it, a height and a weight. And you may ask things like, as was asked a moment ago, covariance. You know, tall people wear but way more. So those two things will those two numbers will vary together. And so there may be an underlying model, a bivariate, two variables, distribution function, and we may ask things about its central tendency, its dispersion, where dispersion won't just be variance, it'll be covariance, and things of that nature. So I want to talk about what we mean by a distribution when it's not one variable but two, or three, or four, or ten. Um, what mean, you know, when we have that distribution, what if we only care about one variable and not the others? And how would we compute that? Uh, what if we have a distribution and we know one of the variables, but we want to know what's the, what's the probability on the other variable, given that we know one of them? That's called a conditional. Uh, how do we invert them? Extremely useful. Will affect most of the rest of the course. So this is kind of an outline of where we're headed. Um, these are things that, you know, are like what we've been talking about, but in the multivariate case. Uh, and I've been glissing around the term independence for a while now, and we'll, we'll be defining that quite soon. So to start with multivariate, let's do things where all outcomes are equally likely, and I can just do probabilities by counting, okay, just to give you an idea of what's going on. So this is a deck of cards. Uh, I think I used this example once recently. No, maybe that was the other class. I uh, can't remember. Anyway, so deck of cards, standard deck of cards is there are four suits, clubs, uh, spades, hearts, diamonds, and for each suit there are 13 cards, one through 10, jack, queen, king. Okay, so you've got 52 cards. And so imagine I shuffle the cards and uh, pull one out and show, you know, I'm about to show it to you, and we want probabilities for how that card could turn out. And imagine I, I have this model, which is that my shuffling is perfect, meaning all, oriented, all orderings of the 52 cards are equally likely because I shuffle so well and so hard that that's true. Now, actual shuffling doesn't work this way. So is it Diaconis that did this in class? So Stanford, Percy Diaconis, uh, would you know, come up with this example, and then he would take a brand new deck of cards and spread it out and show the class that it was exactly in this order. 
then he would put it together and sit there and riffle shuffle it a bunch of times and then spread it out and it'd be back in the order it started in. Okay? Uh, actual shuffling by humans does not randomize. <laughs> if you're really good at shuffling. But if you're really good at shuffling, it really doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but well, our model, as you remember, we're, we're in abstract probability world now, not reality. In abstract probability model, our model is that when I say we shuffled the cards, I meant we shuffled them such that every possible 52 factorial orderings, 52 possibilities for the first card, 51 remaining possibilities for the next card, 50 for the next card. So 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, dot, dot, dot. That's the number of orderings of 52 cards. And so all those are going to be equally likely. So we're going to act like we've totally randomized things. And then we can ask about what's the probability of various events, and we can do that by counting. So um, we can do that by saying how many events, how many uh, atomic events are in the event I'm talking about, and how many uh, events uh, are there total? So there are 52 atomic events total. Uh, oh, that's not the order in which I expect to come. Um, so I'm going to go out of order. I'm a little confused. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about probabilities of various events. So we're going to draw one card, and then we're going to ask about probabilities of various events. Uh, so, what's the probability that when I draw a card, I get the jack of hearts? So, there are 52 cards. We're acting like we've randomized them so that every card coming out when I pick one is equally likely. So, there are 52 possible events that could happen, and there's only one jack of hearts, so it's one out of 52. What's the probability of diamond? There are 13 diamonds, there are 52 cards, it's 13 out of 52, which happens to simplify to one fourth, which is kind of obvious because there are four suits and they all look like they're equally likely because they all have 13 cards in them, so it's one suit out of four. Okay, um, so that's gotten us started on discrete probabilities. I need to define some other probabilities of things that could happen, so I need some notation. So, conditional probability is the probability of event A given that event B has already known to occur. So, here's a Venn diagram. You saw those in you know, grade school sometime in your life. In the rectangle are all the things that could possibly occur. Say, all 52 cards are possible. And there are events, such as it's a jack or it's a heart, A being it's a jack, and B it's a heart. So suppose I write a notation, what's the probability of A happening given that I know B happened? So I know B happened means I'm no longer just in the rectangle, I'm in the circle called B. I know that. And so all events outside there are now irrelevant because I know B happened. And so the probability of A happening given that B happens is the probability of this intersection out of this hole. So it's the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So with counting cards, that's obvious. So for example, what's the probability that I get the jack of hearts given that it's a heart? So there's only one jack of hearts, but Given that it's a heart, we're now in a universe not of 52 cards, but of 13 cards. Okay? That's the idea. Uh, which happens to be the same as what we were just saying over there, which is 1 out of 52 divided by 13 out of 52. That's what the formula is telling you. Okay? This is just a counting argument. But this is the, the actual definition of a, what's called a conditional probability. To the right of the vertical bar is a condition. You are conditioning a probability on one event being certain. Okay, so let's go back to our 52 cards and do some more examples. Okay, uh, I did probability. Okay, so what's the probability of ace? Speak it once. 
four out of 52. There are four aces and 52 cards. Four out of 52, which also happens to be one out of 13, because suit doesn't matter. Suits are all the same, so it's four out of 13. Okay, what's the probability of a heart? Well, it's the same as the probability of a diamond. It's one quarter. What's the probability that it's an ace and a heart? So what's the probability of ace of hearts? Well, it's the same as the probability of a jack of hearts, because everything is the same. So it's one out of 52. Okay. So what's the probability of ace given that it's a heart? Okay, it is a, a heart, so it's one of those 13 cards, so I had this written down just a second ago with a different example, otherwise that was 1 52nd out of 13 50 seconds, that's the formula for the previous slide. Okay, so look at what just happened. The probability of ace is 1 13th. The probability of ace, given that I tell you it's a heart, is 1 13th didn't change. Meaning, my informing you, I picked a card, and you're wondering how the probability of it being an ace. And you estimate it as 1 in 13. But now I tell you, I don't show you the card, but I tell you it's a heart. And you don't change your opinion at all. Which means heart was uninformative about whether something's an ace or not. So those two events, being a heart and being an ace, are referred to as independent. So that's the definition of probabilistic independence, is that probability of A given B equals probability of A. Now, this is probability of A and B over the probability of B. That's the definition. So we do a little bit of algebra, and we get probability of A and B. B equals probability of A times probability of B. Both of these are definitions of independence. If these are true, the two events are independent. So in a deck of cards, the probability of something about which suit it is and the probability of which number is on it are independent events for any combination. Telling you the suits doesn't help you figure out whether it's an ace or a jack in a full deck of cards. Uh, okay, let's move on down. What's the probability that it's not the jack of diamonds? The probability that it is a uh, jack of diamonds, and I'm going to put a little bar on there saying not. It's all the cards but one. 51 out of 52. Um, okay. What's the probability, last one, what's the probability that it's an ace given that it's not the jack of diamonds? It's not the jack of diamonds. The jack of diamonds is out of the deck. It's all the other cards are left. How many ices are in that 51 cards? So it's four out of 51 cards. Otherwise known as it's 4 out of 52 over 51 out of 52. That's the formula. But notice it just changed. Probability of an ace used to be 1 13th. Now it's uh, 4 out of 51, which is not 1 13th. Which means this event and this event are dependent. That if I tell you it's not the jack of diamonds, I've given you information and your probability that it's the, an ace has now changed. Okay? So in, the one thing I often say, I don't know if it's necessary here, that in English, or probably any natural language, sometimes we use the word independent to mean either this could happen or that could happen. They can't both happen. Mutually exclusive. That's not this. In fact, that's the opposite of this. Okay? You know, uh, rainy days or yeah, you know, and, and snowy days, they don't both happen, right? They're just independent stuff. 
That's not probabilistic independence. If I tell you it's not raining, the probability that it's snowing just went up. Okay? So in the probability sense, that word means something very different than mutually exclusive. And sometimes in casual English, we use the word independent for mutually exclusive. So don't trip on that. Okay? Independent means that if I tell you about this event, I have given you no information whatsoever about this other event. Your estimates of probability have not changed. Okay, so now that's the discrete version, and that's this is a discrete bivariate distribution. One variable is what suit am I, the other variable is what number am I. So now let's move to the continuum. So it still has to be a graph with probabilities of different combinations of events. It doesn't have to be a uniform one. This one is uniform, all the cards were equally likely. So a bivariate distribution, a bivariate probability density, is going to be something where every sample is going to have two numbers that pop out, height and weight of the randomly chosen person or whatever. And here's variable number one, here's variable number two. So every sample has both an x value and a y value. So every sample is a vector, x comma y. Some combinations of x and y happen often, some happen less frequently. I've plotted this two different ways. Here it's plotted as a heat map, where brightness is probability density. Here it's pl plotted as a, on a mesh grid. And yes, Arrow, I fixed this one. <laughs> um, and what you see over here is it's, you know, looking like a bell curve of some kind, but it's in two dimensions. It's also looking correlated, meaning bigger x's go with bigger y's. And so all these issues that we're going to talk about, that we've been talking about with samples come up here for this uh, abstract entity known as a probability density function. So probability density functions, when it was univariate, was a curve. And the area under the curve added up to one. This is now no longer a curve, it's a surface. So what adds up to one? The volume. The volume. It's the, the, the stuff underneath it. So it's going to be an integral over all possible combinations. If we have three variables, you're not going to have a word for it because it's going to be a four-dimensional function, the three variables and height. If you have 30 variables, you know, you're not going to think about what it looks like. But nevertheless, the integral over all possible uh, combinations of variables will have to add up to one. So that's our definition of a multivariate density function. It's a function of the variables, however many you have. Could be two, could be five, could be you know, 500 could be, you know, deep net, you know, 20,000, whatever. It's a bunch of variables, and they uh, can take on various combinations of values, and over all possible combinations of values, they have to add up to one, which in a continuous sense, add up to means integrate. Okay, so that means we can do all the stuff we were talking about before with a density. So a density is going to be a function of a vector, or we could write out the pieces of the vector, right? So in the previous page, n was 2. It was 2 bivariate, it was 2 variables, but we can now generalize it. So it's going to be a function of vectors. p is a function of vectors. It's going to be a function of vectors which integrates to 1. Now that's not going to be a integral, it's going to be a multiple integral. You're going to have to integrate over x1, over x2, over x2. I integrate over all of them, add it up, and see what you get. It's got to add up to 1. Um, and now we can take the formulae that we had in the univariate case and see how they extend. So we can still have a concept of expected values. So what's the average vector I expect it to produce? So x could be any number of things, y could be any number of things, and if I basically extend the... Uh, formula that I had for expected value for this multivariate case, you'll see that the expected value of the vector is, I get the expected value of the first component, ignoring the rest, the expected value of the second component, ignoring the rest, etc. So that's the centroid. And it's going to be, uh, have a formula that's going to look like the other one did. So I have this... <coughs> So I used to have this formula which said for a univariate case, the expected value of random variable x 
is the integral of little x uh, p of x uh, dx. Okay? But now, we've got x is a vector, possibly two components, possibly 50, whatever it is. And it's just going to be the integral of x, the vector, and this is going to be a multiple integral, uh, p of, that's my surface plot I just showed you, the p, uh, d x vector, which if you want to write it out, is going to be dx1, dx2, dot, 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 dxn. Okay? So, it's just another integral, but it's an integral over this multi-dimensional space. But it turns out, if you think about it, that the first component of this result is going to come from the first component of this thing, which is going to come from just the probabilities of first components. So that immediately brings us uh, to something that's going to be a few slides hence. So we're going to come back to this slide and work on it a bit, but I just want to put us in the context. So, similarly, uh, we're going to have this concept of covariance, which, if it's centered on zero, if the expected value is the zero vector, then it's going to be just like what we've been talking about before. It's the outer product and take its expected value. Uh, if it's not mean-centered, you're going to have to mean-center it. So it's going to be the expected value of x minus expected value of x, so center it, multiple outer product with itself. Um, and this is just an integral, just like it was last time, which means it's going to satisfy linearity. If you multiply x by stuff, you can pull it out. But now multiplied by stuff can be multiplied by a vector or a matrix. And you can just pull it out. So you expect the value of a matrix times your vector, you can pull the matrix out. For the same reasons that for integrals, you can pull out, multiply by a constant, and you can pull out sums. Um, and covariance is, assuming that this guy is, that, that x is mean centered, but I didn't subtract the mean there, so I'm assuming it's mean zero, is the expected value of this times its transpose, which means you're going to pull out the matrix twice. You've seen this formula before, we did it for samples. So basically everything we did for samples um, generalizes to this abstract notion. Okay? We're going to come back, work with this, do a bunch of stuff for this, but that's for Thursday. See you then.